Hello, dear friends. I'm happy to welcome you and to greet you this afternoon. My name is Ihor. I'm a Ukrainian tour guide. And today I'd like to invite you for a tour into Carpathian Mountains. It's uh, one of many uh, trails uh, and routes uh, which I conduct as a tour guide. And also this is uh, the place which I also like to visit just myself with my friends and my, my family as well. Um, so today I'm representing the Vidvidae team. This is the tour company that specializes in multiple uh, great Ukrainian tours, uh, local tours uh, as well. And also thanks to our computer technologies and uh, Vidvidae. So um, now in a minute, we'll start and Today, we virtually find ourselves amid the beautiful Carpathian Hills. So one moment, I'll just switch to my presentation and we'll start. Okay, so Ukrainian Carpathians, uh, no, you, only part of the Carpathian mountains are in Ukraine, about 10%. The rest of the mountains are scattered uh, around the Eastern Europe. So we can speak about uh, well, Romanian Carpathians as well. There are Carpathians in Poland, in Slovakia, in Hungary. Well, and uh, uh, today we're going to visit a little part, a little but uh, pretty interesting in terms uh, of uh, locations and landscapes. We'll be visiting the Skole uh, ridges. So Skole is uh, the name of the town. Well, we're, we'll visit it uh, virtually today during the tour. Well, and a few, few words about why people go to the Carpathians. So what's the reason? And uh, I'll start with a beautiful Carpathian views. You know, we can find ourselves uh, well, uh, seeing the marvelous, uh, marvelous views around. We can see the ridges, uh, uh, forests. Uh, so uh, the place we'll be visiting today, it's not so high. So generally Ukrainian Carpathians are not very high. So the highest mount is uh, just about uh, a bit over 2000 meters. Well, uh, the area we'll be visiting today, uh, so the average altitude is in between 800 uh, meters and 1200. So let's say uh, between 3000 and 4000 feet. Well, so we can catch nice views there, we can go hiking. Well, and it's another view that opens from one of the locations that we'll be visiting today, the Tustan uh, Fortress, nice hills. Well, you know, the people go to the Carpathian Mountains to see their very eco-friendly land, you know, full of uh, great air to breathe, full of greenery, full of beautiful forests. And also it's a chance to see uh, how the local people live. You know, that mostly people uh, live that traditional lifestyle as their parents and grandparents uh, lived many years ago. So the cattle is very important. So we can see here, uh, well, the cows, uh, usually when we go to the mountains, we see a lot of cows, we, we see uh, sheep uh, grazing in, in the Carpathian pastures. Also, please pay attention. We have a little haystack here. Well, and uh, sometimes when you travel to the Carpathians, you can see hundreds of the haystacks on the way. And sometimes it's just amazing views. You know, I sometimes for joke, I call them uh, uh, Ukrainian pyramids. Well, and we can see also the wooden houses. It's something, you know, that, which is typical for the Carpathian area. Also the mountainous streams are multiple. Well, so we go ahead. And another thing that, you know, touches and uh, well, what we have in Ukraine, uh, pretty interesting, you know, as experience is the wooden churches. So a lot of the wooden churches, they are of different types. So uh, in this picture, uh, we can see one of the wooden churches, um, we call this Boiko sort of, uh, of church, Boiko kind, with the three domes. Usually the central dome is a little bit higher and bigger. So three domes, symbol of Holy Trinity. And uh, amazing, but some of those churches would be like over 300, even 400 years old, which we might see in the Carpathian area, and they are active, and the people go and pray there, and we have authentic icon stands, icons there, and the people are very, you know, traditionally religious in in this part of uh, of Ukraine. 
So we go ahead and, uh, oh, excuse me. Okay, now we go ahead. And uh, of course, uh, virtually today during the tour, we're gonna see uh, many rivers. And the largest one is called Dniester. It's actually the, one of the largest uh, rivers of uh, Ukraine. But here in this part, which we'll travel today, so it's not so wide. So it just starts as a swift Carpathian uh, river. Well, and then it gets wider, getting a lot of tributaries on the way. So it looks beautiful. Well, it you know, floods from time to time, uh, but it happens pretty uh, rarely. So Dniester uh, River, third largest river of Ukraine after Dnieper and Danube. And you know, there would be chances in the Carpathians to catch the marvelous views overlooking the hills, overlooking the uh, nice Carpathian villages. So this is the view over uh, overlooking Kaminka village, which we'll be visiting, we'll be visiting today. Well, uh, you know, it's much history as well. And uh, today we'll be, well, we'll see uh, several historical buildings. Uh, among them, uh, one of my favorite objects to see is a Grodel's Palace in Skole, you know, the Grodel's family. Well, they had uh, the whole forestry republic uh, since uh, late 19th century. So they did a, did a high scale forestry and exported their wood all around the world. And this is a palace that they owned. Well, uh, it is preserved pretty well until and now. This is the historical picture. We'll also see how the place is uh, uh, looking today and I'll give you more details. So let's go further. And of course, cascades and waterfalls. It's one of the things that people would like to see. And today I'm planning to show you uh, the Kamienka waterfall. It's a little one, but very uh, picturesque and we'll talk a little bit about their um, great Carpathian water, great in terms of the how it looks and the great in terms of quality. So we'll see a lot of their uh, like water resources today. And uh, at the end of our tour, we're going to visit one of the Carpathian lakes. Well, and another great place to see. Well, usually, uh, you know, when we uh, travel offline, it takes about seven, eight hours. Well, but because we use our computer technologies, uh, well, we can make it within one hour. Uh, so that'll be there, like the brief tour. So we'll touch different themes and different locations. But I hope there will be a sort of incentive for you. And if you like that, uh, you can just get ready to travel that place, in, well, offline, yeah, in, in real life, who knows? So let's uh, start. And our starting point is uh, Lviv, uh, dear friends. So we start from Lviv, where uh, actually now I'm physically uh, located. It's a great starting point. So you, it, the place has an international airport. I just like selected uh, several photos that you know, represent Lviv, uh, how rich it is in terms of uh, architecture, while well, a lot of uh, great sites because it's um, UNESCO World Heritage. It has a lot of museums. Uh, beautiful buildings and uh, this is a place that if you once uh, visit it most people would like to return again and again well there are more photos that feature uh, Lviv as our starting point well but uh, today we will leave that beautiful place because it's something to see around in its vicinity so let's go and i'll uh well please have a, a look on our map so the way we will move today, well, you see the Lviv is in the, uh, on, um, on the top of the map, and then we'll go south, actually, as this red arrow shows us. Well, so the, um, the distance that we will have to cover today is uh, around 175 kilometers. So uh, on the way, we'll be visiting um, uh, locations, uh, well, like Street Town will be passing, and then you'll see that our most distant point uh, is called Korostiv Village. This is already surrounded with the beautiful Carpathian Hills. Well, also on the way, we'll be visiting Urich, or also the place is known as Tustan, uh, a site for the historical fortress and a very beautiful um, naturally. Well, and uh, um, well, so this is, a, this is the way how we're gonna move yeah, from north to south, uh, several stops on the way, and then 
well, we'll finish back in Lviv virtually, of course. So let's go ahead. So uh, driving south, uh, one of the first stops that's worth of the time to see, well, maybe now this picture well, wouldn't represent it in a full beauty. Well, this is the great complex uh, once uh, constructed by the Count, by a local nobleman, Mr. Stanislav Skarbek, who was a man of the great initiatives, uh, business initiatives, uh, well, and also famous for his charity, for his charity, charitable actions. Well, uh, at the end of his life, he allocated a huge sum of money and made a whole foundation uh, to set up, well, the institution for orphans and for the seniors. And it uh, happened to be the largest institution of that kind in, in Galicia, because historically we also talk about our land as Galicia. You probably know that there is Galicia in Spain, in northern Spain, but there is another Galicia in Eastern Europe, and this is the way how our land was called um, at the time of Austrian-Hungarian Empire. Okay, so this is another view how this huge complex looks. So uh, nowadays it is uh, used as a hospital for the people with mental diseases. Well, there is a little museum room inside which tells us about it. Mr. Skarbek, his initiatives, uh, well, the way how he arranged this. Well, and uh, it's another view. Well, pretty, you know, it's pretty gorgeous building. Um, very impressive in terms of, well, it, it's not maybe in the best stage now, it needs some renovation. Well, but even this, uh, the way it looks, it's still very, very impressive. So uh, once it was home for uh, over 400 orphans and 600 seniors that got a good care and uh, orphans had a chance to get an edu initial education thanks to Mr. Skarbek and his foundation. And also they learned some of the skills so they could start their jobs later on. Well, another view. And uh, well, just a few, few other photos for you to, you know, to make an idea how this thing looks all around. You know, the, the people, uh, local people, we actually hope that in the future, part of it, you know, it would be great to make a museum there, well, or, or at least a wink of, of this complex that is surrounded with a beautiful park. And within the park, well, we can see the ruin now, once it was a beautiful mausoleum of Mr. Skarbek. So uh, mausoleum uh, where he was buried actually. And you know, we had a har some hard moments during the World War II and especially you know, during the Soviet occupation so that Soviets devastated it. And now that place really needs some renovation. Well, the people of Lviv also remember Mr. Skarbek and I'll please have a look at the uh, picture. Uh, well, he's another project and great um, piece of architecture that he, you know, was designed uh, thanks uh, to his uh, sponsorship was a theater in Lviv. And this building is uh, now also under renovation. It still serves as the theater. Well, and this was a gift of Mr. Skarbek to the inhabitants of Lviv, to the city people. For 50 years, the city could use it for free. Well, so let's go further and find, find something else uh, interesting. And on the way after, um, uh, afterwards, so we'll be passing the Dniester, uh, the, the Dniester uh, River. And uh, well, here it's uh, like pretty, looks uh, pretty, uh, well, shallow, let us say. Um, well, but from time to time when there are rainfalls in the mountains, so it floods and it happened several times. Well, uh, generally speaking, dear friends, I have to tell you that the land we are visiting today in this virtual tour, uh, it would be a paradise. So it has, uh, it's so beautiful. Well, it, it, you know, the God created it for people to live. Uh, we don't have any forest fires, it's very humid, plenty of rain. So we also do not need irrigation. Well, uh, for agriculture because of, plant, you know, enough humidity. Uh, we do not have earthquakes. Uh, we'll, uh, we, well, we do have some floods, but not very critical in this part of the mountains, which we will be visiting today. Well, so uh, beautiful nature, beautiful climate as well. So like no tornadoes, uh, no real uh, natural disasters. Mm, well, the only disaster would be the politicians, I would say. And uh, 
on the way now, we are coming to see the street town, a beautiful historical town uh, with, the, with a nice historical city center that uh, preserved. And uh, please have a look at the uh, city hall of, uh, of Stri from 19th century. It's another view of this. So uh, local people are proud that when there was independence movement started in Ukraine, it was still the time of Perestro Horbachev's perestroika, but Ukrainians already made their steps to gain their independence. The uh, Stri city hall was the first place where the Ukrainian national flag, you see the Ukrainian national flag until now, uh, well, it's on the top of it. Well, the first place that hoisted Ukrainian national flag that happened um, 14th of March, 1990. And now we go um, to see another point of view of, of the city hall. And uh, another beautiful building uh, that we can have a look is the Ukrainian uh, national uh, house. Uh, it was a sort of the Ukrainian club which was used as a like, convention hall. And also there were different Ukrainian organizations which had their office uh, there. Well, you, Stri as a city had a very a strong Ukrainian community. Well, and uh, a lot of famous Ukrainians visited that place. Um, and uh, one being in Stri, they sometimes gave lectures, uh, had a meetings with people inside the national house. That's another point of view. Also, it's uh, 1901. Um, the style was a sort of eclectic, like combination of, uh, of different historical styles. Well, uh, we have uh, several rooms inside which serve as a museum and this room well, is dedicated to Ukrainian national leaders whose life was related to Stri. Well, among those, there was a uh, Ukrainian national leader, Stepan Bandera. The one, uh, well, he and his organization uh, offered a stubborn resistance to the Soviet Union and uh, Stepan Bandera lived so, well, several years in Stri and visited gymnasium here. So also we have a couple of their uh, memorials were, that commemorate the victims of the uh, uh, Stalin's repressions of the Soviet occupation as he called it, or another part of the monument. So beautiful town Stri. Well, generally, you know, it's a nice stop on the way. It's about 70 um, kilometers uh, away of the city of Lviv. So I, I think it's a great pit stop just to see the architecture. Well, we'll see more. This is the gorgeous uh, uh, neo-Gothic uh, Roman Catholic Church. So the, uh, I, I have to tell you that uh, Stri would probably offer us much more interesting buildings and beautiful like this one. Well, but because of the frequent fires that happened in 19th century, uh, many got destroyed. So the, uh, the church is really impressive. And this is the way it looks uh, from inside. So there is an active Roman Catholic community. You know that after the World War II, well, that most of the Roman Catholics, they had to leave for, uh, Western Ukraine. So they were forcibly relocated and they had to, to leave this land and uh, well moved to other parts of Poland. Well, and most of the um, uh, Roman Catholic churches got closed. So, but nowadays, uh, this period, the churches come back to their believers. Well, and I beautifully renovated as it happened also in Stray. So another beautiful piece of uh, uh, art on the wall. Look at the details, uh, look at the beautiful attic and this well, uh, gorgeous doors with the uh, forged yeah, ornaments. So the street also has a number of Arnovo buildings, and this is a good sample. Well, uh, it's time to leave uh, uh, Stree, and then now we'll be approaching the, the hills, the mountains. Well, and we'll be crossing now the Boiko land. So the Boiko are one of the ethnic groups that populate the area. And, uh, you know, any, any place that you enter the, the, the Boiko land, where the Boikos live, well, uh, usually it is featured with a very high uh, economical uh, like infrastructure. So you can see that uh, there is a higher business activity. So in my opinion, Boiko people that are traditionally lived in the foothills of the mountains, well, and they were engaged in agriculture and uh, later many of them got engaged also in the, uh, in the trade. 
even in international trade. Well, but in 19th century, many went to the towns and cities. Well, and they're very smart people. So they are very practical. So they uh, learned how to live uh, in, uh, you know, in uh, pretty severe conditions because well, the winters, for example, in mountains are pretty, pretty severe. So uh, now we'll be virtually going further. And here is another river. It's a, a stree, already one of the tributaries of Dniester. So the Carpathian Hills start already. So you can see there, uh, so well, and on the way, a couple of rocks. And this is the place that historians proved that once it was the, in princely time, in the times of the Kievan Rus, Rus Galician Principality, it was a sort of a fortified uh, place, so like a fortress. Some nice rocks to see, and this is the way how the, the place looks from the height of the birds flight. So uh, the name of the village is Verkhnia Sinovidne. Uh, the boy goes from this village once um, were engaged in international fruit trade. So they had affiliates, their branches all around Europe. Well, and uh, most of the fruit, for example, that got to Galicia and were sold in local markets, they got there um, through the hands of uh, the local boycos. Okay, and the time now comes to visit one of the like, highlights of our tour. Uh, we call it Tustan. Uh, also, uh, that place sometimes is referred uh, on the maps as Urich, so the Urich is the name of the village, and Tustan was the name of the fortress. It's actually uh, translating into English, Tustan means stop here. And now let's come closer, and we can see that nowadays the place looks like their assortment of rocks and look very beautiful. This is another point of view, a beautiful. Um, surroundings, uh, nature around. So when we approach, well, the rocks are very impressive and there are some trails there where, where we can go up the, up the rocks and catch the beautiful panoramic view. So we see that, so it's like a wooden trail. So let's take it and in a minute we will find ourselves upon the hill. And this is the view we're gonna catch from there. So this is a fragment of the Urich uh, village down the hill and the Carpathian hills in front of us. In this area, not so high, but already very picturesque. We also have not far from the place, from that place we have the, one of the uh, famous mineral water spars called Schidnica, where people come to improve their health conditions, drinking mineral waters. Well, and uh, uh, wandering around the rocks, uh, we can see the stands that tell us actually that once upon a time, it was a very impressive fortress. So on the top of the rocks, there were uh, wooden frameworks, there were, there were walls, and they had five layers. And this is the, the picture that uh, gives us an idea how in generally, the, the fortress uh, looked. So please pay attention that uh, there were lower uh, layers of the fence. So impressive wall, another one. Well, and then upon the, uh, upon the, the hill. So there was quite a fortress, a wooden one. And I have to uh, point out that it was one of the play uh, fortresses, one of few, that uh, Mongols uh, didn't manage to seize. So Batu Han, and he was crossing that area on the way to, to Hungary, crossing the mountains. Well, he came to conclusion that it was no way to attack uh, the fortress. So huge it looked and so well defended. So it's a white. Well, the, uh, now white was called stop here. So it related to the merchant route, which was nearby. And the main product that the merchants transported to sell it in the markets of Eastern Europe was the salt. So since ancient times, it was extracted in the Carpathian area. Salt was, um, you know, hundreds of years ago, it was very expensive, let's say 13, 14, 15th century. 
well and um, and the, the good taxes were paid. So the merchants passing by that place, they had to stop and pay their taxes. Also, you know, that uh, um, uh, the merchants also required some protection, um, some, uh, well, protection from, from the lords, uh, from the kings. And there was a military garnison, actually, that was living here up the fortress. And well, they were protecting that route. They were collecting the taxes. And this great salt business was until the, well, it's another view nowadays. Well, nowadays it looks different, and this is just the, um, well, they use the computer technologies to recreate the way it looked before. And who knows, uh, you know, we have ambitious projects that uh, if, uh, well, there would be some finance, and uh, I think in the future it's possible to recreate it as it looked before. So let's hope for this and let's, let's keep it as our dream. So like in 16th century, the salt stopped uh, being strategically important product uh, because in other parts of Europe, uh, it was extracted already in other mode uh, in mines and the Carpathian salt, which was extracted from, uh, uh, from the water. So it took um, more time and it was more uh, time consuming and energy consuming since uh, the local people had to fire wood under the bowls, then the water evaporated and the salt left on the bottom of the, of the pots. So this worked very well, but uh, when then the mine salt became much more cheaper and uh, this local business uh, uh, could not compete. And six, since 16th century, so the merchants stopped using this trail and there was no, no more need for the fortress. So the garnison and the people just left it. It was never conquered, it was never seized, amazing. Well, sometimes uh, this beautiful place is uh, used for the historical reenactions. It's a great place also to travel with the families. So the kids love play there. You have some of the uh, wooden uh, uh, like uh, mock fortresses to play and they're used for this reenactions. And uh, every year, there are festivals where we have the uh, historical clubs uh, that arrange their like knighthood tournaments. And this is one of the rams that is used during the festival and historical reenactions. Okay, so that was, that was Tustan and it's time for us to go ahead. So next place we'll be visiting, it's called uh, Skole. And actually this is uh, the name of the location that gave the name to the whole area, like Scholar Ridges. So uh, one of the most interesting things to see in Scholar, you know, there are several objects. And um, because uh, let us say we have rest restricted time. So, well, let's focus on the most interesting, in my opinion, which is the palace of uh, Brunel's family, the family that were, was engaged in forestry. So the palace comes from a 19th century and the uh, local story says that one of the bro there were four brothers so the, the, well, uh, which made this big forestry business. And one of them uh, uh, made, well, participated in the design of the palace himself. So this is the way it looks from a side in fall, another view. So the Grottles owned it until the outbreak of the World War II. So then during the World War II, it was used sometime for the uh, Gestapo office and later by NKVD. Uh, the people uh, of Skola, they still remember, you know, how kind the Gretels were when they, when they owned that place. Well, they, they had 4,000 people that worked for them. Uh, some worked in the forestry and the sawmills, uh, wood processing plants, and the others were foresters. Well, uh, and the Gretels um, usually, well, they, uh, well, for many of the, for many of the employees, uh, so they gave them the place to live and they also supplied uh, the wood for heating and cooking. So when there was a married couple, um, so somebody from the employees got married, they also provided transportation. So they, every winter they invited kids, well, uh, uh, 
like the children of the employees and they arranged a special party and gave the generous gifts. So until now, the uh, old timers of Skola, they still remember how good people they were. Uh, well, good businessmen as well. They had four liners that transported local wood um, around the planet. So first uh, from the local uh, wood processing plants, they, uh, they used uh, railroads uh, to, uh, to transfer the wood up to Trieste or up to Odessa, and then the liners picked them up, the ships, and uh, transferred uh, sometimes even to other continents. Uh, there was even uh, the idea, and they realized, uh, to establish the local currency. So there was like a local uh, sort of money, uh, plastic chips, that the employees got, and they could uh, buy stuff in the grocery shops and other shops of Skola using them. Amazing. So nowadays, the, um, the palace is... Um, uh, is uh, actually used as a part of the orphan school and there are projects now and we have uh, some uh, local enthusiasts, volunteers who see the palace in the future as a sort of the office building or a um, local museum. So we have such ideas and we are working on it. So in a, I hope in a few years um, we have chance to realize those projects. And this is how the place looked in 19th century, very well kept. So the local kids uh, told stories that well, when they went to bring some food to their parents who uh, worked in the wood processing plants, they were passing by the palace and they could see the little reindeers that were grazing in the, you know, next to the palace in the garden. Also the grottles, they arranged the great hunting for the nobility of Europe. They had a lot of uh, like uh, noble friends who came from other countries. They kept the population of uh, reindeers uh, pretty high. They fed them in winter. So the people came to hunt. Uh, and um, it was a very no well-known place before the World War II. I hope it will be known again. Uh, we go further. And, you know, it's already some time that we travel, ladies and gentlemen. So it looks like uh, it's time to, you know, relax a little bit because it was um, a lot of uh, information uh, and places that we have, uh, uh, we have seen already. So uh, let's visit the trout farm and, and have some snack. Well, it's uh, pretty nearby, very cool, just like a few kilometers, let's say, from, from the Grodel's Palace. And trout is a very popular fish in Ukrainian Carpathians. And this is something to taste, I have to tell you. So. Um, well, we'll talk a little bit further about cuisine, and uh, there's a chance also to, uh, you know, to fish. Uh, everybody has a chance. So one day I came there and fished. I, I'm not a professional fisherman. I, I have very little skills, you know, but uh, uh, even me, <laughs> uh, not so much professional. I, I caught a couple of fishes, and then they can be prepared. I can be cooked. They have different recipes. So I just um, think that we can order some trout and oops, it, it, you know, uh, it's amazing. Uh, we, uh, we can, uh, within our virtual tour, order the trout and, and it comes in a while. So that's one of the strong points of, uh, of our tour. So it looks very nice, served yeah, with lemons, with different sauces. Uh, so I strongly believe that someday uh, it, it, well, when you visit the Carpathian area, you will see not only the picture, but you'll have a chance to taste this delicious Carpathian trout. So that was like a little, um, a little pit stop. And then we continue, ladies and gentlemen. So next is Koristu village, which I love very much. Uh, and just imagine this all is, is just like when we travel in uh, um, offline, so it's only a few minutes in between one place and another one. So after the fish farm, just a couple hundred meters and we can visit the beautiful uh, Carpathian village with a lot of the uh, wooden houses. So this is one of the views, hills around. No, half of the village is wooden. Like in, in Ukraine, we can see places where, well, we have special uh, full, uh, full architecture museums 
so like where we can uh, uh, you know see uh, the wooden objects and the houses where people lived 100 years ago but believe me we have places in ukraine where people still live in wooden houses and of course they use wood for cooking and heating and a local person would all, always tell you that the, the most delicious food is cooked on on fire using wood okay so let's go further and uh, another attraction of the Korosti village uh, would be there uh, the museum of old uh, old uh, trains so this um, was such an idea to, um, that came from the Austrian uh, volunteer so he uh, uh, engaged uh, several uh, local enthusiasts and they decided to recreate the old uh, narrow uh, trail uh, railway which Gretels once used to transport the wood from the mountains to uh, the pro wood processing plants and uh, several uh, old trams the wagons were brought from different areas I was told the story that one of the wagons was actually taken was extracted from the marsh Unfortunately, uh, this museum was not finished. So because of different bureaucratic uh, problems and financial uh, things, questions as well, but a part of it um, can be observed, can be seen, and it's amazing. So it's like uh, in the middle of nowhere, let us say, uh, surrounded by the beautiful hills, uh, we have authentic uh, um, old tram wagons uh, to observe. And of course, it's very Instagrammy place. So photos taken there are very unusual and uh, can be the highlight for the Instagram too. So let's go further. Well, and um, now it'll be time for us to visit the Kamienka. Uh, well, the people call it waterfall. Well, uh, I would call it more, um, let us say, uh, 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 in, in different mode, like cascade, because it's a little bit, it, it's, it's not a real waterfall, but still very beautiful. And so this is how it looks on the way back. We are already on the way back let us say to Lviv and uh, it's a very refreshing uh, point and um, so we have multiple waterfalls in the Carpathians and also much higher ones well and um, uh, some people even try to swim there in the hot summer days it's uh, it's there is such a chance uh, Carpathians um, are famous for for the waters and local people would call it life water because it's like a water that broke this through the stone. So it brings uh, the energy of F. It brings a lot of minerals and vitamins and uh, you know, crystal clear water. So one of the things what you have to do in the Carpathian mountains is drink some water, uh, not necessarily from the waterfall, but uh, well, we have a lot of the water springs too. And this is another uh, another viewpoint. Uh, I was visiting this uh, place uh, yet in March and in spring, it looks pretty gorgeous. So the area, well, the place, the, the, the cascade is near the Kamienka village is visited by a lot of local people and also for, uh, well, uh, by the foreign guests. So there are places there to have some snack. Well, to, uh, well, there are some, some trails to go around. And one of the trails will bring us to the beautiful uh, Carpathian, so the beautiful Carpathian like uh, uh, lake. Uh, a part of the lake already converted into the marsh. So it has a very rich vegetation, and um, well, the, this uh, this uh, place some people call it dead uh, lake or dead pond because the um, well the lake doesn't have the outcome of water. And this why it's been converted into the marsh, but very, very uh, nice colors and a beautiful area around to visit. Well, and uh, uh, if time permits, uh, well, you know, the visitors can go further on the, in the direction of the Kaminka village. And this is a chance to see the real life of the local people. Uh, the wooden houses, the haystacks, yeah, I remember. Ukrainian pyramids, the cows and sheep that sometimes cross the road, geese and ducks. And you know this, uh, it's amazing how, you know, how traditionally people still live. So there's not so much, let us say, dependent on what happens in the economy, 
because they try to make their life like self-sufficient. So they do their agriculture and they do not have so much land, arable land, as you see, because it's just like only a little plot in between the mountains. But still, they do their best. They grow a little bit of everything for, for, um, for their family needs, uh, for their own consumption. We call it so-called green, so green economy. Well, but uh, well, they do not use any chemicals uh, usually because they grow food for themselves. And there'll be potato that they grow. Uh, well, potato is a very special product in Ukraine. Well, that uh, later on, maybe in some other and some other tour, uh, I'll focus more on this. Also, there would be some beans, well, and some uh, other vegetables, uh, red beet. Uh, carrot, onion, so like a little bit of uh, everything. And that's why we, we got a sort of like organic food because no chemicals are used. Also the, yeah, the, 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 uh, the village houses are scattered around the hills. So usually the Carpathian villages take a vast area. Well, and uh, almost every day place you come, you can see the sort of mountainous stream as we see here. So this is what sometimes happens. So when you drive uh, over the, or along the mountains, well, sometimes you have to stop the car because the cows are crossing the road or the cows, they just behave like they are uh, they're the main ones here. And uh, a chance to say hello, a few words, yeah, to the cow herds, to the shepherds. People are usually pretty friendly. So it's a chance to talk to them. The distances in the Carpathians, uh, local people, they, uh, uh, if you ask the question, like, is it far to come to that place or another one? The common question usually is like, oh, it's very close. It's just like over there. But sometimes this over there might be in like in 10 kilometers or 15. So local people uh, got used to go hiking, to go to the forest. Well, you uh, know, the forests are abundant in mushrooms and berries. This is what um, uh, people do a lot. So one of the trophies to bring from the Carpathian Mountains, and then later on, I'll come to the point, you know, what kind of souvenirs you can buy. So uh, let, let's catch a view now over there, the Kaminka village. So one moment, I'll just make a little pause. Okay, and it looks like, yes, we still have time. You know, to talk a little bit about the products of uh, of the Carpathian Mountains, so we catch this nice view overlooking the Kamienka village. Well, and um, so when you come to the forest, you know, usually it's a lot of mushrooms. We have uh, several dozens of edible mushrooms, but local people uh, usually focus on uh, several kinds, uh, well, which they believe are the best ones. And they call them real mushrooms. Well, and this is uh, when, you, when you drive uh, in, in different places, you know, they sell them. And they are very big experts. Uh, and in general, generally in Ukraine, in Western Ukraine especially, people eat a lot of mushrooms. Well, mushrooms are a must product on the Ukrainian Christmas table. Well, and this is something that you can buy in the shops and well, let's say relatively pretty expensive or you may have it for free. So when summer comes and mushroom season opens, so a lot of people go and uh, pick them up. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, well, that's, that's about it. So let's say uh, we, uh, well, we made this tour, you know, that's very, in very short mode. Uh, I've seen the, uh, I've seen uh, the places which we uh, plant. We even, uh, well, had uh, some lunch, uh, some snack and uh, trout. So thank you, thank you very much. So now I would like to also to, um, let's say, right, just to, uh, can you see me by the way? So I hope that, that you can. Okay, so um, just summarize actually. So let's let's uh, make and draw some summary. So the uh, today uh, we, we had a maybe a short tour. Well, and we tried to visit different places. So I tried to make this tour diverse, so that we visited uh, 
the historical sites, uh, the Tustan, uh, the site of the Tustan Fortress. Well, we visited the beautiful town of uh, Stri. We uh, visited uh, the couple of nice uh, villages. Yeah, we visited a couple of nice villages. Well, and um, so what are what can be other um, uh, let us say activities? So usually, uh, well, during the tour, it's a, it's a chance uh, uh, to taste the local uh, cuisine. So except of the trout, which we already tasted, I have to mention some other uh, some other local products. Okay, we also uh, mentioned some mushrooms, and they are very important part. Well, uh, one of the dishes that uh, we just love in the Western Ukraine and people eat a lot is potato, potato pancakes. Well, potato in general, well, there are a lot of this stuff in Ukraine. I would say that Ukrainian cuisine is pretty potato based. And if you uh, drive in Ukraine uh, in spring and summer, you can see how the people cultivate it. Uh, well, it's maybe it's par partly a joke. Uh, but potato growing is more than uh, is more than agriculture in Ukraine. is is uh, is like a tradition. It's like a national sport as well. So make sure that when you are in Ukraine, uh, I hope that someday you'll come. Well, make sure you'll try that. Uh, also, uh, the berries. You know, the Carpathian Mountains are well. The forests are full of of berries and uh, uh, it's okay for people. It's uh, allowed uh, to pick them up. Uh, maybe except of the um, reserves, natural reserves. So I, I, I speak about the raspberry and, and, and the st strawberry, well, and especially blueberry. Uh, and you know what? Uh, uh, any product that comes from the Carpathian area, when it comes to the market to be sold, uh, usually the vendors, they keep the price pretty high. And when you ask, well, why, why this, those mushrooms or those berries are more expensive than the others? So the vendors just say, you know, it come because they come from the Carpathian Mountains. And then it goes without saying, oh, yes, Carpathian Mountains. That means the most eco-friendly land where the products are extremely high quality, anything, mushrooms or berries. Or another thing I would like to, uh, to speak about is, uh, is it local honey. So one of the things uh, that I usually recommend to buy in Ukraine is, is the local honey. Uh, Ukraine is one of the largest exporters of honey in the world and the largest one in Europe. Well, and in Carpathian Mountains, we have a very special Carpathian bee. Uh, well, it's a sort of the bee, uh, which is very industrious. It starts collecting nectar from flowers uh, well, when the nectar, uh, well, let's say when the sugar percentage is uh, very low, so other sorts of bees would not pay any, even attention, but the Carpathian bee already works. Well, it's very industrious and also the local bees probably uh, know by intuition that, um, uh, well, they have a limited time for, you know, for, for, for flowers. Well, it's time to pick up the nectar. Uh, so the, the honey, yeah. Have a look. Usually, you'll be offered um, several sorts. There will be linden tree honey, and there will be so-called multifloral, which is the most popular probably and the most balanced uh, taste. Sometimes you will be offered to taste and buy unusual uh, honey, which uh, looks pretty brown, and this is the buckwheat. Well, and in generally speaking, uh, if I already mentioned the honey as, as a souvenir, as a product, why? So I have to tell you in general that Ukraine is a very sweet country and uh, generally because uh, we do not export only honey. We export also chocolate and Lviv where we started and where we returned uh, back after this um, uh, virtual tour is famous for its chocolate productions. Well, Ukraine as a country, we export also, also sugar, which we manufacture from the sugar beets. So, well, pretty sweet country. Well, and um, another thing that you may be offered in the Carpathian Mountains as, let us say, a supplement yeah, to make more fun, to, to have additional experience, is the Carpathian Sauna. And you remember we visited this uh, trout farm. So they have the, uh, well, this option 
for, uh, for visitors, for the guests. So that looks like a big bowl um, made of metal, metal bowl. Um, and it is designed for three, four persons, sometimes even for more, for five and six. So it is filled with the mineral waters. Well, sometimes they use the artesian uh, well, sometimes the mineral waters are brought from uh, nearby um, mineral water spa. Well, and then they put the logs, wooden logs underneath and they hit this bowl with the mineral water. Uh, also, they bring uh, some of the uh, little stones from the, uh, from the Carpathian rivers so that the people would feel more comfortable Then the temperature goes up uh, towards about 40 degrees, a little bit over. Well, and then, you know, and then the people get inside. Well, uh, at first the feeling is like it's pretty hot, but then, you know, they get, you get adjusted to this. And it's very funny. It looks very funny from, uh, from outside. So if you have got a photographer, you're gonna get a really amazing picture for the Instagram, you can just imagine it happens on the open air. Uh, well, the Carpathian, so this, this a sort of procedure, healthy, healthy procedure. Uh, well, it happens only under the open air. And then a lot of vapor in the air. And then the, there is fire underneath. And, uh, and the people's heads are over, over the margin of the ball. Well, and it's, it looks really amazing. So um, the idea is to change several times. So you, you get and you relax just in this, you know, mineral, hot, heated mineral water. Well, um, in may, well, many places you, you, you also serve some tea, herbal tea to drink. Well, then in a certain moment, it's time to go and, uh, you know, uh, well, uh, try some cold water. So it's just that you change hot water into the cold. Uh, sometimes it's directly from the river. And after this, you get back in, into the bowl. So after several times, usually it's like two or three sessions, you feel yourself like you're reborn. So you feel like you're about to fly, you know, uh, absolutely amazing feeling and uh, something new to, uh, you know, to try in the, in the Carpathian mountains. Well, um, I have also to mention that uh, what I like Carpathian mountains for is that it's a ni very nice combination of the virgin nature and also the pretty uh, developed infrastructure but developed uh, in the way that it's comfortable to travel, but it's not overwhelmed with concrete. It's not overwhelmed also with, uh, yeah, with a lot of people, crowds. Uh, well, it's very comfortable to, to travel in the Carpathians. So usually you are very often, yeah, you, can, you can have a close contact to nature. You can have a close contact to the local people. You can taste their food. You can uh, talk to them. And uh, well, some of them would tell you that they bake their own bread and they would, can taste it. Some have the beehives. Uh, uh, well, also in special holidays, they put all the traditional costumes, which they embroider, keep all their minor traditions. And you know, in the in this period when the well, when the world is is getting more and more cosmopolitan and modernized, you know, such places that where traditions are still kept, you know, they are great to visit and to learn something uh, new. Well, so uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I was very happy uh, to bring you today to the Carpathian Mountains virtually. So um, thank you so much for, for spending some nice time together, in my opinion. So thanks for uh, being a part of this, uh, of this tour. And uh, I would remind that uh, the tour uh, is thanks to our modern computer technologies that we use, uh, Zoom. And thanks to the team of Vidvide, or um, also the uh, well, they also known under the brand uh, Visit Ukraine. Vidvide, Visit Ukraine, that arranged this uh, for us. So welcome back uh, to Ukraine, to Western Ukraine in, in particular, and to the beautiful Carpathian Mountains. So I wish you every success, and I'll be happy to see you someday back uh, in either in Lviv. Uh, or any other beautiful place of Ukraine. Thanks and take care.